So we'll skip through some of the slides. So we'll focus. There are, in fact, three parts of this lecture slides remaining. Voice, uh, streaming, and then IPTV. We'll skip the, the streaming part and go straight through to IPTV. So the first thing is how do we send or how do we deliver voice voice data across the internet? And not just the internet, but a, a general any IP network. So even across a private network operated by a, a telecom company, how do we take the analog voice and send it in packets? Most of all, all of the telephone networks that have been around for 100 years use circuit switching, do not use packet switching. So your normal home telephone line, the landline telephone network, you pick up your phone and dial a number. There's a process of contacting the person at the other end point, And then your voice, your voice data is not sent in packets but is sent in a circuit switch connection from your phone to the destination's phone. Of course, in the internet, we have a packet switching network. So how can we adapt and make voice calls, taking the analog data for your voice, and put it inside packets and send those packets across the internet such that we get the same service as if we were using our home telephone line? So we'll go through two, two approaches, or two, two main parts of delivering voice over the internet. Now you'll hear different terminology. So you may hear voice over IP, or VoIP, V-O-I-P, meaning sending voice using the internet protocol. Uh, other things, voice over the internet protocol, IP telephony. So just different terminology, uh, but we will not differentiate between any of them. Internet telephony, internet phones, voice over the internet. And there may be different scenarios where voice over IP is used. It may be in a public internet, like you may use with, a, with Skype or a similar application. So you just use your normal internet connection and make voice calls. Or it may be in a private network, like a telecom company's network. Uh, for example, in 4G mobile phone networks, instead of using a circuit switch connection from your mobile phone to the telephone network, then you can use a packet switch connection and send that voice from your mobile phone through all the way through the internet via a packet switch network. So you're effectively using voice over IP. So, and another example is internal. For example, most organizations have an internal telephone network for internal calls. Uh, that can be a circuit switch network or an, it can be a packet switch network. So SIT can build their internal telephone network to use voice over IP. So in fact, use their LAN network to also carry the voice calls between phones and the offices as opposed to having two different networks. So some examples of where voice over IP is used. We're going to go through two, two uh, sets of protocols that are needed to support voice over IP. Uh, and before we describe them, RTP is the first one that we'll describe. Remember the basics of a voice call. What you do when you pick up a phone, or you dial in a number on your mobile phone, or even using uh, your computer, you dial in a number, then what happens? Well, before you talk, there's this process of connecting from your phone to the, the caller, callee's phone, destination. the destination. So we have a caller, the source, and the callee is the destination. Okay? So you make a call to someone. So there's this procedure of when you type in their number, then there's some signaling that goes across the network to make their phone ring. Okay? So their phone rings, and if they pick up the phone, or they answer, they press the answer button, then there's some signaling that comes back to your phone indicating that they've picked up and you're connected. 
So this is the signaling used to set up the connection between the source and destination, the caller and the callee. Once it's set up, then we start sending the voice across the network. So there's two parts. Set up the connection and then transfer the data. RTP is for the data transfer. In fact, we're going to go to the second part first, the, the data transfer. And we'll see it's very simple. And then after that, we'll look at two examples. In fact, just one example of how we can set up a connection. Assuming we've got a connection set up, then how do we send our voice, the analog data, across the internet? Well, quite simply, we take the voice, we use a codec to convert it into bits, and then we put those bits in packets and send the packets. And a common protocol for sending the packets is RTP, the real-time transport protocol. And we'll see it's very simple compared to, for example, TCP. RTP is not just for voice, it can, it's in general can be used for audio or, or video. So it's not just for voice, it can be used for sending video. Yesterday in the demo, when I streamed a video between my two laptops, it was using RTP. The, the video was encoded and put inside RTP packets. RTP uses UDP as the transport protocol. So that's a bit confusing because RTP, the name says it's a real-time transport protocol. Let's try and draw a stack and see how RTP fits in. So we have the network layer, IP, underneath that the data link layer and physical layer, whatever it is, we're not so uh, concerned with that. And then above that we have the transport layer and the application layer. So the application layer protocol, think of that's your voice application. Uh, whether it's Skype or something else. And we'll note later that Skype doesn't in fact use RTP. Other voice applications do. Now, as a transport protocol, we use UDP. And RTP, in fact, makes use of UDP. So although UDP is the transport protocol, sometimes we also consider RTP to be a transport protocol. One way we may draw it is like this. So an RTP packet is put inside a UDP packet. And a UDP packet is put inside an IP packet and then sent across the internet. What's inside the RTP packet? The audio generated by your codec. So your analog input, when someone's talking, That generating some analog input when they talk. The codec, which is part of the application that you're using, converts that into bits. And puts those bits inside an RTP packet, which then is transported inside UDP and IP across the internet. So that's the, the, the role of RTP in the layered stack. So sometimes, even though UDP is a transport protocol, we also consider RTP as a transport protocol. Real-time transport protocol is designed to support real-time data. So when we care about delivering the contents with minimal delay. Why not just use TCP? TCP is used for data transfer in many applications. Why not TCP? With TCP, remember we have congestion control, flow control, and error control, retransmissions. TCP is good for reliability, but it can be bad in terms of delay. That is, we send data, and we cannot send more data until we receive an ACK and all the congestion and flow control mechanisms work. And if we send data with TCP and there, there's an error, that data segment is lost, then we cannot send more until we receive an ACK. 
And in that may that delay from when we send the first until we can send the next data segment may be too much for real-time applications. So TCP can introduce too much delay for our data transfer to support real-time applications. So UDP is simple. With UDP, as you saw when you use iPerf, with UDP you just send packets according to what the source specifies. With all of you are experts with iPerf, when you want to set the client to use UDP, you use the minus U option, and then you must specify a sending rate. In fact, if you don't, it defaults to one megabit per second. So with UDP, the application determines how fast the data is sent. With TCP, it's determined by the, the congestion and flow control algorithms. RTP, we'll see, has no congestion control. It has no flow control, no error control. Effectively, we just send the packets. So there's no guarantees of reliability with RTP. No guarantees that we'll deliver the data within some time frame. But it's kept simple so that there are no or very few overheads that TCP would have. So what does it do, RTP? It allows any type of media to be transferred across the internet using any codec. So it doesn't specify what codec to use. You don't have to use uh, MP3 or we'll see G711. There are many different codecs we can choose from. It doesn't have to be voice, it can be video. It takes the content, so the, the digital data generated by the codec, puts it into an RTP packet, adds a sequence number so that we can keep track of, okay, this is the first part of the content, the second, and so on. Adds a timestamp, which can be used by the receiver to determine when to play back that content, and sends it. So that's the main functions of RTP. Let's look at the packet format and see what's sent. <coughs> so in my example on the board here, the data that we want to send is the binary form of the analog input of the voice, for example. We take that data and put it inside an RTP packet. So here's the data. And the RTP packet has some header fields, uh, some we can recognize from this uh, diagram. There's a sequence number. So when I'm talking at the source, I'm generating a lot of data. I will take a portion of that, put it in an RTP packet, and send it. And then the next portion of the data generated in the next RTP packet and send it. And of course, we give sequence numbers, one, two, three, and so on to the RTP packets. A timestamp. So relative to when each packet starts. So we'll see some examples later, but if the first piece of data corresponds to time zero, and the second packet contains data corresponding to some time after, then that time can be included in the timestamp. And then the receiver knows where this data fits in relative to the other data that's already received. By default, the header has 12 bytes. There may be some options. We will not cover any options in this topic. Payload type indicates what content is inside this packet. In particular, what codec is used. We'll see some examples later. Uh, we have a version field, and then what do the others mean? If we include options, we set the X bit to 1. 
if we have some padding, we can specify in the p bit whether we need to expand the size of the packet to fit a particular length. Some applications may use markers to indicate where this content fi fits in, in the overall stream. Think of, for example, like chapter markers in a video. Something that marks a particular point. And the M bit can be used to indicate if they are used markers. The payload type is an a integer that indicates the codec use. For example, payload type 0 means PCM 8 kilohertz, 64 kilobits per second. Type 3, GSM, voice codec. The source and the contributing source we'll see when we look at mixing. So we'll come back to translation and mixing in a moment. Let's look at a simple example of one way that we can encode voice and send it across the internet. The example there's linked to on our website, it's from a Cisco uh, document. They, Cisco, have some information about some typical codecs that may be used for voice over IP and some calculations of how much, how fast we need to send the RTP packets. There's a nice table that captures some different codecs. Remember, the codec is to specifies the algorithm for how we take the analog input, the voice, and produce the digital data that we want to send. And there are different algorithms. Here are some algorithms that are, are commonly used for voice, voice over the internet. Let's look at the first one and explain the columns. And maybe it's almost the, the baseline codec in, in that it's... Uh, corresponds to closely what's used for a telephone network. G711. It's just the name of the standard that defines this codec. Another codec, for example, is MP3. What does MP3 stand for? MP3. <laughs> M M it's related to MPEG. MPEG, what is MPEG? MPEG is a group, uh, the Motion Pictures Expert Group. It's just an organization, MPEG. MPEG, MP3, the three is referring to one of their substandards. So MPEG creates many standards. One of them is MPEG or MP3. MPEG4 you've heard of, MPEG2 as well. So MPEG is an organization that creates standards. Another organization that creates standards for voice and video is ITU, the International Telecommunications Union, and they label their standards or codex with this letter dot followed by a number. G711 is an ITU standard, for example. And they've got many other ones as well. Let's look at G711. And we see in summary the bit rate the rate at which we send our data is 64 kilobits per second. What a typical way to use the G711 codec is that, so remember when you're talking, you're generating analog data and continuously the codec is creating bits as an output. And then we need to transfer them as packets across the network. So, with the G711 codec, the, the codec size for every sample is 80 bytes in this case. And, in fact, we can change these values. These are just typical values. Okay? So, we take 80 bytes at the time. And an interval of 10 milliseconds. So every 10 milliseconds, we're taking, we're generating 80 bytes of digital data. So when you're talking, think of every 10 milliseconds, this codec records what you've said for that 10 milliseconds, converts it into binary, and gets an 80 byte value as an output. We'll come back to MOS later. What, 
what our application then has to do is to put it into packets to be sent across the network. And in this case, the typical packet size, the voice payload, is 160 bytes. So what we do is we take, we've got voice coming in, we take 80 bytes, the first 80 bytes of voice, and then another 80 bytes, and so on. So let's say from the analog input producing some digital output, break it into 80 byte chunks. But we don't send 80 bytes at a time across the network. In this case, what we're doing is we're sending 160 bytes per packet. So we take 160 bytes, two samples here, and that's our 160 bytes of data, and then we use RTP to send that data across the internet. So we take the 160 bytes of voice, which is two samples, we attach an RTP header, the RTP header, RTP has no retransmission schemes, no flow or congestion control. We just add the header fields and send it to UDP. And then UDP does the same, adds its header fields and sends it to IP. Running out of space here. This is our data. And then IP does the same. I'll draw that bigger. So the packet we get, the IP datagram we get that to be sent across the internet, we can draw a bit bigger, has an IP header, a UDP header, RTP, and let's say the voice data. And then we send it using the data link layer. Now, depending upon our computer, we may have different data link layer protocols here. So th again, that may attach a header. But let's uh, just focus just on the internet protocol, because that's common across all computers. With G71, one, in this example, we take 160 bytes of voice data and every packet, every RTP packet contains 160 bytes. The typical size of the RTP header we saw in the, the slide without options is 12 bytes. A UDP header, we don't have it here, but if we look it up, we'll see that a UDP header contains 8 bytes and IP contains 20 bytes. We're going to do some calculations and, and see what the columns give us. Uh, let me just check how they calculated or what, whether they included Ethernet or not. So we get the same numbers. Uh, I think they do include Ethernet. We were not. Optionally, we could add the Ethernet header here and say, indicate the size of the Ethernet uh, header. And in fact, there's a trailer as well. What we want to look at is how much data do we have to send across the network in these RTP packets to deliver the voice? Recall what the codec does. Every 10 milliseconds, we take a sample of the voice and convert it into 80 bytes. So how many bytes per second have we got? Or bits per second? Mm. 
and the answer's in front of you, but you can try and calculate, calculate it. 64 kilobits per second. Why? Every 10 milliseconds, so we've got voice, and every 10 milliseconds we record that value of voice and convert it into 80 bytes. So in one second, we do that 100 times. So in one second, we have 180 byte chunks. So 100 by 80 bytes, 8,000 bytes per second, which is 64 kilobits per second. So with this codec, we're producing data at 64 kilobits per second with the G711 codec. With other codecs, it's different. There may be compression. There's no compression in G711. It's just simple PCM. We take samples every 10 milliseconds, producing 80 bytes per sample. But we don't send each sample in individual packet. In this case, we're sending two samples per packet. So how much do we send across the network? Well, how many packets per second do we need to send? How many packets per second do we need to send? How many packets per second? PPS. If we want to deliver this voice across the network such that when they receive it, they receive it at the same rate as which it's generated, how many packets per second do we need to send? 50. Because each packet contains 160 bytes of data, or another way contains two, two samples in each packet. We're sampling every 10 milliseconds, so effectively each packet contains 20 milliseconds of voice. One sample is 10 milliseconds of voice, two samples is 20 milliseconds of voice. So this packet, this voice data represents 20 milliseconds. It's you talking and for 20 milliseconds that's then encoded into the using PCM into binary. Therefore, how fast do we need to send? Well, in one second we need to send 50 packets per second to get the same rate packets per second, PPS. So now that we know how many packets per second we need to send, we can work out what data rate we need of our network to deliver that. Because we see that each packet contains 160 bytes of data plus some header. And we've got 12 plus 8 is 20 plus 20. So, so far we have a packet, an RTP packet of 200 bytes. And if we're sending 50 packets per second, every packet is 200 bytes, then what's our sending rate? What's our sending rate in this case? Eighty kilobits per second. Fifty packets per second times by two two hundred is ten thousand bytes per second. Ten thousand bytes per second, which is eighty thousand bits per second, eighty kilobits per second. That's our sending rate. The answer 
in this column is 82.8 .8 kilobits per second. When they calculated it for this table, they also included the Ethernet header. I think that's the difference here. Okay. So I haven't included it in, the, in this calculation. Because let's assume we don't know what the Ethernet header size is. To be more accurate, we would include the Ethernet header and, and the overheads of Ethernet, and we get numbers like in these columns. So our voice codec is generating 64 kilobits per second, but because of the overheads of the protocols, we have to send at 80 kilobits per second. So some of the numbers that we're calculating are shown in this table. So if we have a payload size of 160 bytes, then effectively the payload contains 20 milliseconds of voice, two samples. Each sample is 10 milliseconds. And we must send 50 packets per second. And if we now calculate the headers, in my case, I've just included up to IP, we'd need to send at 80 kilobits per second. If we include others, then we, it's up to 82. Uh, the difference between the, this column and this with CRTP, you can compress the headers. To save space, you can make them smaller. And if you use this option of compressing the headers, then you don't need su such a high band, uh, sending rate. This is the sending rate required to deliver this voice across the internet. Now, let's assume we have our, a simple network, source, destination, and a link between them. Uh, and let's say that, in fact, coming into the source is many people making voice calls using this codec. And there's many eventual destinations. And the bottleneck link in the network is between S and D. And let's say the capacity of that link is 1 megabit per second. Let's make my calculations easier. 8 megabits per second. So we've got two, two, uh, two endpoints. Link between them is 8 megabits per second. That's the capacity. The question that we may want to answer is, how many voice calls can we support across this link? What's the answer? How many voice calls can we make at the same time using the G711 codec across this link? 100 voice calls. Our capacity is 8 megabits per second, or 8,000 kilobits per second. 8 megabits per second is the capacity. That's the maximum speed we can send at. Or 8,000 kilobits per second. For every voice call using this codec, we must send at 80 kilobits per second. If we send at a lower rate, or we, some of those packets are dropped, then we will not receive and be able to play back the, the voice at the receiver correctly. So we've got 8,000 kilobits per second as capacity. Every voice call needs 80 kilobits per second. Then we can have 100 voice calls at the same time. Yes, yes. Uh, so to make life easier, we're focusing on in one direction here. So you're right that we should consider both directions. Uh, let's say the capacity is, is full duplex. So I can send 8 megabits per second in this direction and the same in the opposite direction at the same time. So we'd need to specify that to be clear. Yeah. So focusing on this direction. Of course, voice calls, bidirectional. So if we focus just on this direction, what do we need? Uh, if we have a capacity for this direction of 8 megabits per second, then 
a hundred voice calls in this case. This is something that we may need if, for example, we want to connect our campus with the Rungsit campus and allow all of our voice calls between campuses, between offices, to go via the link between those two campuses. So we have a link between our two campuses. We know the capacity of that link. We know the number of people in this campus and the destination campus. And if we know the codec we're going to use, then we can estimate or we can calculate how many voice calls we can support across this link at any one time. How many people can be talking on the phone at any one time? What this table shows is some different codecs and different combinations and you'll see the numbers uh, give us different results in terms of number of voice calls. Any questions? What's packets per second? PPS. Okay. How many packets we need to send? Okay. So, because we don't necessarily take one one sample and send it in one packet because it may be inefficient. So this, in this case, we took two samples in each packet. And you see some other codecs and some other combinations. For example, G726 is 32 kilobits per second. We take samples every 5 milliseconds, 20 bytes per sample. And here, each RTP packet contains how many samples? Contains four samples. Each. This is the packet size. This is the sample size. So we take a sample every 5 milliseconds and then every 20 milliseconds we send a packet. And that 20 milliseconds or that packet contains 20 milliseconds of voice. So we can have different combinations here for the different codecs. And therefore 80 bytes per packet plus the overheads still every 20 milliseconds, so still 50 packets per second, then we can calculate the total sending rate required, uh, whether we have compression or not, and if we take into account some other overheads in Ethernet. And you see some of them are not every 20 milliseconds, so in this case, the G728, 16 kilobits per second, we send 60 bytes containing 30 milliseconds of voice. So if every packet contains 30 milliseconds of voice, we'd need to send 33.3 .3 packets per second to deliver that voice across the network. So given the details of a particular codec and how it encodes into packets, we can work out either what's required to send or if we also know the capacity, for example, the number of voice calls that can be supported across the network. In our network with 8 megabits per second and our G711 codec, we supported, what, 100 voice calls. If we used G729, can we support more or less voice calls? G7129. More than 100 or less? Hands up for more. If we use G71, G729 instead of G711 and our same network here, hands up if we can support more voice calls. Hands up if we can support less voice calls. Alright, try again. If we're using G729, with G711 we can support 100 voice calls. Now we change the codec. Our application uses a different codec. And now we're using G729. Can we support more voice calls? Hands up. 
few more hands all right less voice calls with the G729 codec we will not do the exact calculation but you see that the sending rate required is less than the G711 codec because we're only producing 8 kilobits per second of voice. So we don't have to send so much across the network, which means for each voice call, we send about 27 kilobits per second across the network, which means if we have 8 megabits per second divided by 27 kilobits per second, we're going to get more than 100 voice calls. It goes up. Okay. So the lower, the lower the sending rate, the better it is for our network in that the more voice calls we can support with a given capacity. The sending rate is not an indicator, or a high sending rate is not an indicator of good for network performance. We would like a low sending rate to deliver the voice across the network, a low bit rate. So the lower the bit rate, or the sending rate, in this table, the bandwidth, the lower the value, the better. That is, the more voice calls we can support. Any questions on that? So don't get confused between sending rate and things like throughput. Normally, we talk about data transfer. Throughput, we want a high value. That's good. But here, we want as small a sending rate as possible to deliver the voice across the network. So G729 gives us a smaller sending rate than G711. Why? Because of the encoding and especially we, we take less, we take the same number of samples but eight times smaller. With G711 each sample was 80 bytes and G729 each sample is just 10 bytes. So we send less. So we support more voice calls. What's the problem then with using G729? It's better for my network. I can have more people talking at the same time. What's the problem? The quality. Okay. The quality is much lower because we're taking the voice and we're encoding it into only 8 kilobits per second. We're not getting as much information. So when we play it back at the receiver, the quality will be lower. Remember last week I played some uh, audio? They were using some of these codecs. The best one was G711, which is PCM. The lower rate codecs produce lower quality output. So there's the trade-off. More voice calls supported, but lower quality voice calls. And the mean opinion score is some measure of the quality. So there's the way to measure that is in, you should do some audio tests to measure the quality. So there's some typical mean opinion scores. The opinion of the receiver on how good the quality is. G711 is the highest, 4.1. The other ones have a lower mean opinion score. It's a measure of quality. So that's the basics of RTP. There's no retransmissions. We just put the data in our packet and send. We'll have sequence numbers so the receiver knows if we receive things out of order. But if something's not received, it doesn't ask for it again. There's no retransmission. That was RTP. We can use it not just for voice, but for other audio, audio and video. The last one on RTP, and I will just quickly mention, there are different features of RTP called translation and mixing. Translation is converting the content types. For example, 
midway between the source and destination, you have a special device that changes the codec. That's translation. For example, I'm sending from my source computer to the destination, which is some mobile phone. The concept is if I use one codec here, a good quality codec, which requires a high sending rate, then some intermediate device, when it recognizes that this, this content needs to be sent across a wireless network, say to a mobile phone where the data rate or the capacity is much lower, it can translate from the G711 codec down to a lower quality codec, like our G729, for example, and then send to there. So this device does translation, converting from one codec to another. And the main idea would be to, uh, to change to a codec which is more suitable for the receiver. If I was sending to another PC, then maybe it would stay as G711, a high quality codec, but sending to someone with a lower uh, capacity or low, lower capability device, I may translate. Mixing is another feature which allows you to have multiple sources connected and sending. And then this intermediate device takes the content from those multiple sources. So there's an RTP packet sent across, sent from each source. And this device mixes the content together and sends it out as a single RTP packet. This is, for example, with audio teleconferencing or even video conferencing where maybe there are three sources or people at three locations on a teleconference, or four locations in this case. And the content coming from these three sources can be com combined together. So there's audio from the three sources. You can mix them together to get one audio content which represents all three and then send them in one RTP packet, as opposed to sending all three copies across the network. So that's the, the basic concept of mixing. And it can lead to performance improvements because we can send less across the network. And that's all we want to say about those two features. The translation is converting from one codec to another. Mixing is combining the content from multiple sources to get one, one content as output. There are, remember, RTP is just about sending data across the network, the voice data. There's an RTP control protocol which is used for sending some reports about what's happening. For example, the sender can send a report to the receiver. The receiver can send some report to the, to the sender about the quality that they're receiving. So I'm receiving a certain quality. The destination measures, measures the quality, sends a report back to the sender, and as a result, the sender may adjust how they send their data. They may change the codec, for example. So just some reporting between the different entities. Not so important, that one. The other important part for voice over IP is signaling. How do we set up the connection before we transfer the data? How do we make the phone call? And that's the generally called signaling. In an old style telephone network, landline, the public switch telephone network, the main protocol used for signaling is called signaling system number seven, SS7. And it handles this, this feature of when you pick up the phone, dial in a number, it sends a signal across the network, the switches set up the path, and when someone at the other endpoint picks up their phone, a signal comes back and they set up the path along the way. So that's the idea in the, the landline telephone network. 
What about in an IP network? Again, we need a signaling protocol. The two main ones are called SIP, the Session Initiation Protocol, and H323. In fact, the main one used in the internet today is SIP, Session Initiation Protocol. This is a protocol that when I open my voice software on my laptop and choose someone to call, and I press call, the protocol sends some packets across the network and the callees software should start ringing. The destination software should start ringing or give some notification on their screen. And when they answer, it should send some message back to my computer to say that they've answered. And then we start using RTP to send our voice. Okay, so this is setting up the call. Let's briefly look at SIP, the session initiation protocol. It can do many things, not just set up the call, but similar to SS7, things like call forwarding, uh, error reporting, and so on. But we'll not cover them. So the caller notifies the callee when they want to start a call. And it also allows them to agree upon which codec to use. So, for example, both support G711, so they may choose to use that as a codec. But we can see we can have more complex uh, combinations. We use IP addresses to identify the entities. With a landline telephone network, we use phone numbers. Okay, this, what is a 10 digit or so telephone number, different lengths in different countries. With internet, uh, voice over IP, we use IP addresses to ident identify the caller and callee. SIP allows us things like changing the codecs during the call, having conference calls, so not just one-to-one, -one, but having many uh, participants in a call, inviting new participants, call holding, and so on. All the things you expect of a, a, a telephone system. SIP is considered an application level protocol. It uses UDP, in some special cases TCP, but in most cases use UDP. Think of it like a, an application level protocol like HTTP. There's a server, a SIP server. Uh, it listens on some port number. And when we want to make a connection, we send some message to that SIP server, which is like uh, calling that person. And the messages are similar to web HTTP messages. They are text in some, encoded in some format. Addresses are similar to email addresses. For example, SIP and then the username at some domain name. And the domain name can map to an IP address. So the idea is that if you want to call someone, you need to know their SIP address. SIP doesn't say how to use or what to use for data transfer, SIP is just for the signaling. For the data transfer, we can use different mechanisms. One of them, of course, is RTP, but others can be used. A simple example of how it works. Bob, Alice wants to call Bob in this case. These are the IP addresses of their computers. They don't have domain names in this simple example. Alice knows the IP address of Bob's computer in this case. So that's the assumption for this case. How do they know it? Well, we need different ways to know it. We can use DNS. Uh, SIP has some special servers to keep track of IP addresses of individual users. But in this case, Alice knows the IP address of Bob's computer. And they know Bob's username, it's Bob. So what Alice does, or her voice software, uses SIP to make a call to Bob. And the basic exchange is we send an invite message, invite them to the call. And it has some format, and the basics are, so similar to, you've all seen them, a HTTP GET request has some format, a SIP message is the same, some text, 
uh, with some meaning in this case, invite Bob at that IP address. And some optional fields. In this case, we include the IPv4 address of Alice and give some indication of what content we're going to transfer in the call and what protocol to use. In this example, it's saying we're going to have audio. We're going to transfer the audio using RTP. And AVP is the audio video profile, <coughs> the codec type, codec type 0 in this case. What this is saying is that Alice is telling Bob, once we set up this connection, let's use RTP, and in particular, when Bob sends data to Alice, Bob should use RTP with codec number 0. And Bob should send to port number 38060. That's for the data transfer. Once we set up the connection, we need to communicate using a particular protocol. In this case, Alice has chosen RTP, codec 0, and port number 38060. We send this message to Bob's computer. It's sent to port number 5060. That's the SIP port number. And as a result, Bob's phone rings, or his computer software gives some notification saying you're being called. And when Bob picks up or answers, SIP sends back an OK message. And it's similar to, to web browsing. We send back a 200 OK, where 200 is the status number, and OK is some short status code, saying that I accept that connection, and sends back the IP address that Bob is using, and sends back the, the content type that Alice should use to send to Bob. Alice should use RTP audio video profile number 3, a different codec, and send to port 48753. When Alice receives that, again on port 5060, sends a final ACK. And that's the normal procedure for setting up the call. Once we've set up the call, then they send their data. So they start talking. And when Bob is talking, Bob is taking, we're taking his analog voice and we're encoding it into some digital form. How do we encode it? Well, Alice said she wants to use codec zero. And you can look up, there's a table that specifies what codec zero is. So it turns out it's the, the basic PCM codec, like G711. A common name is micro law audio, but the, like the G711 codec that we used in our example. And Bob's application sends it to port 38060 at Alice's computer, as specified in Alice's invite message. When Alice is talking, it's, she doesn't have to use the same codec. In this case, it's set up that when Alice is talking, she's using the GSM codec, codec number three, which Bob indicated. So you can use different codecs in each direction and different port numbers. So the blue parts are the basics of a SIP invite, and then we do the data transfer. And after the data transfer, there's SIP messages to close the connection, to hang up, for example. So they are the main, well, the very simple introduction to SIP that we use it to set up a, a connection for a voice call and for other multimedia applications. There are many different messages. This is just a simple example of an invite, an OK and an ACK, but there are different messages for different purposes, for different features for our telephone system. Any questions on SIP? Everyone can answer our exam question in, what, three weeks' time? Just the basics of understand what it's used for. Uh, 
from if I gave you a diagram like this in the exam, you should be able to answer questions like what port number should, uh, from the first three messages, what port number should Alice receive her data on? Okay, it's in this message. Alice sends a message to Bob saying, when you send me data, use RTP, audio video profile zero, and port number 38060. And similar, Bob indicates what he wants to use when he receives data. And here, in this example, we're using RTP. So if you know the codec, you could do things like calculate, uh, given the network capacity, calculate how many voice calls in parallel could we have across our network if we're using this system. So you look, look at the sample size, the packet size, and the capacity. And these messages, these first three messages, were sent using UDP. So I cannot, I will not draw the stack, but briefly, we think SIP, UDP, IP. A SIP message is put inside UDP and sent using IP across the internet. And what is a SIP message? It's just some text, like shown there. enough on SIP and enough on voice. There's some issues that arise of, okay, in our simple example, Alice knew the IP address of Bob. Well, how do you know the IP address of someone else's computer? Well, you can use DNS, so you know Bob's domain name. But how many people have uh, their own domain name? Who here has their own domain name? No one, okay. Uh, so, SIP has some special services that can help keep track of where users are. So, there are special registrar services, servers, and proxy servers that can help keep track of when someone's moving, where to find them. We'll not go through the example, but there's ways to, to use SIP to forward the invites to the right location. Even if that person has moved to someone else, somewhere else temporarily, you can still reach them. So in summary, SIP is a general protocol for initiating and managing sessions. That's where its name comes from, the session initiation protocol. It's not just for voice, it can also be used for video and also data. Some instant messaging protocols use SIP. So when you send a, a, a short message to someone, you can use SIP to do that, to set up that connection. Many phones today, many IP phones support SIP, RTP, and, and related protocols. So these are, think of these as the standard internet protocols. They may not be the most common, but they are standardized by the Internet Engineering Task Force. So your phone may be a soft phone, a piece of software running on a computer that implements these protocols. Maybe a standalone phone, like you can buy a phone which is a basically, an, basically an IP phone which implements an IP stack and those protocols. Or you can get an adapter for your home phone, your, your normal home phone that you can plug into and using an adapter to, to send IP packets. Skype may be the most well-known and the most popular uh, voice over the internet protocol doesn't use SIP or RTP. It uses its own proprietary protocol. So uh, that's an exception. We're not going to go through streamed stored audio or video. 
That's like YouTube streaming. The ways in which the, a web server, for example, streams audio to a web browser. There's not much to say about it anyway. Let's, in the last five minutes, just introduce this topic of IPTV and we'll look at some details next week. So voice over the internet. Well, let's move to video. Video over the internet. TV, specifically. Well, how do we view TV or videos across networks, across the internet? And, and I think you, everyone here, has, uh, watches videos, and in some cases TV, from a, a TV station across the internet. There are different ways to do it. And just to be clear on what we're talking about with IPTV, well, some of the normal ways, open your web browser and visit a website, and it streams that content to you. Okay? When you watch YouTube, that's an example. Uh, and most TV stations have their own, have their content available via websites as well. So you can watch the video via a web browser on a PC, on a tablet, on a phone. In most cases, well, it's getting better, but in most cases the quality of that video is not high. Okay? If you think about the screen size, if you watch YouTube on your laptop, then what, we're talking about this size of the screen, so the resolution is not that high. Although you can get high resolution YouTube, with most, when we're streaming across the internet, the quality is not, uh, not the same quality as you get on your TV. On your TV, the quality people expect is, there's no interruption in the service. That when you watch TV, normal TV, it doesn't pause for three seconds and start again. Uh, there's no pixelation, as, as long as you have a good signal, in some cases there may be. With a TV, the quality is expected to be uh, continuous, constant quality on a large screen. Okay? With web-based TV and video viewing, often the quality doesn't match what you get with watching TV. You can get high quality now, YouTube does provide high quality video. And you can watch it on large screen TVs, but it's not as common. So the, a common way to watch TV and video is via your web browser. But a limitation is usually the quality is not so good. Another way is to download a file and then watch it after you've downloaded it. So the first case is streaming. So you're playing back as you receive it. Another way is to download a file, wait for 10 minutes, and then watch it. Play it back on your computer. So file-based distribution. That's not real time. Okay? Although with high internet speeds, it doesn't take long to download. In some cases, it still takes a lot of time to download before you can play it back. So you don't get instant playback in that case. What IPTV generally refers to is providing high quality video in real time to large screens uh, across a, a network, in particular across an IP network. So it's about delivering video across, an, across the internet, but IPTV generally refers to higher quality video than what we're used to with web browsing and high quality on a large screen, not just on a, a computer screen, for example. And delivering that usually requires some, some special techniques in the network to make it work well. We'll go through them next week. Well, this is not very useful. Uh, I think most people understand that, OK, the, we have screens. What we may have if we want IPTV, we need internet access. Okay, but IPTV, we're receiving the video across the internet, so we have some modem, some broadband or some ADSL connection or, high, or, or cable connection. And then inside our home, we have Ethernet, for example, or Wi-Fi to distribute that content, often via a set-top box, some device that controls the content distribution inside the home sending some parts to the stereo, the audio parts to your hi-fi, 
some parts to different video screens and maybe having some control of that. That's the idea. Why do we need high quality TV? Well, some obvious reasons that you all know about. We can watch TV across, uh, across the internet and we no longer need the normal telephone, a television network. Okay, so the tele television station, the TV station, can distribute their content via the internet as opposed to sending their content via their own network, via satellite or via uh, terrestrial radio. And digital TV we, is one of the applications we can, uh, or the content we can receive. Things like video on demand are more suited to such networks. The user can choose what to watch at a particular point in time. Business applications, uh, it's more useful for, for distance learning, so watching videos, uh, especially if you have um, it set up in, in advance. Inside businesses and so on. But some examples of applications of IPTV. Let's just finish on an example of typical requirements. Let's say we have a home, several people living there, and we want to deliver all of our content via, the, via our internet connection. All of our content means voice. We want to make voice over IP, our standard technique for voice calls. We want to have normal internet access for web browsing and so on. And we also want to have digital TV. All of that content comes across our one internet connection. The question is, how fast does our internet connection have to be? Voice, not a problem. Voice calls, good quality voice calls, 64 kilobits per second is the typical speed required. What do you need for high speed data access? Well, maybe several megabits per second per user. So if you have several people in your home browsing websites, so multiple megabits per second is required. What if we want to stream de standard definition TV? There are different definitions of standard definition, but typically per channel we need several megabits per second to stream SD TV, two to four megabits per second. If we want high definition, we need up to 10 megabits per second per channel. It can vary. So if we have a house with multiple TVs, multiple people wanting to watch different channels at the same time, then the internet access needs to support tens of megabits per second, 20, 30 megabits per second normally. Who has internet access that supports 30 megabits per second? Anyone? Anyone have cable? Not many people. In some countries it's more, just more so. ADSL will typically not support these data rates. We're reaching the limits of ADSL to support this. So we'll see later, and we'll see next week, that if we want to have TV delivered across the internet at high quality, we need fast networks, especially that last mile, that connection from the network provider to your home, that last portion of the network, needs to support data rates of 10, 20, 30 megabits per second and higher. What we'll look at next week is some of the technologies to support IPTV. Let's continue that next week. We've